to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we share stories of Americans breaking down barriers and seeking solutions all over our country. With election season in full swing, we travel to the birthplace of America to see how one city is solving a poll worker shortage. And we tune into a new type of radio station from a Colorado correctional facility that's helping inmates find second chances. But first, a look back at the devastation left on the New York metropolitan area by Superstorm Sandy a decade ago. Tanya Rivero visits one community with an innovative project that's enlisting the help of a tiny but mighty creature to protect against future storms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Off this Brooklyn dock, a short ferry ride from Lower Manhattan, thousands of oysters with a big future are quietly growing. We did it! <laughs> this is what we love, is seeing them grow out. Katie Mosher is senior director at the Billion Oyster Project, a nonprofit that has restored 100 million oysters and counting all around New York Harbor. They're now about two inches and they're reproductive. So that means that they can reproduce larvae that will spread out throughout the harbor. But some of these oysters go over to the living breakwaters, correct? Yeah, so in about two years, we should be ready to put oysters on the breakwaters and they'll be on rock materials positioned in a way so that you have um, lots of spaces for all kinds of species. And so oysters will be a part of that. The Living Breakwaters, currently under construction off Staten Island's southern shore, are a series of stone walls extending 2,400 linear feet that will eventually be covered with tens of millions of oysters, the living part of the breakwaters, a collaborative project aiming to protect the shoreline and promote marine life. My colleagues and my teammates, we tend to go out once a month, twice a month when we can. We rode along with one of the project's designers, Brad Howe of design firm Scape, to see the $107 million work in progress. <laughs> They've been designed to kind of be these interlocking woven structures of rocks. And as the waves approach from this direction, they crash into these structures before they crash into the shoreline and structures on the shoreline. And do the oysters also help with the mitigation of the waves? So the oysters will play a part in it. Yeah, so yeah. eventually the, the oysters will kind of settle on this rock structure. Typically, oyster larvae just kind of float throughout the harbor. And in this area, they don't really have anything to land on and grow. The idea is that the living breakwaters provide that, and then that oyster growth will just make them more robust structures that are living. Rosemary, what did this area look like right after Sandy? This dock here lifted and made their way into the window. Rosemary Saladino runs the family-owned Marina Cafe, a Staten Island staple for over 40 years. But 10 years ago, surging floodwaters from Superstorm Sandy, swelling up to 10 feet high, decimated the Harborside restaurant. The water surged in enough to push the, all the furniture. These boats here, most of them all got pushed to the street. Her family's life work transformed into a pile of rubble. We prepared for a hurricane, sandbags covering the windows, moving furniture, but the devastation was something that we never imagined that would have happened. Saladino rebuilt with the Phoenix-like resilience New Yorkers are famous for. That's up. But she's grateful the government has projects in place to help weather the next big storm better than the last. How does it make you feel that they are building something that is focused on Staten Island? No, I think that's, a, that's awesome. And since we're a small island and sometimes we get forgotten, but I think that's a great thing that we're not getting forgotten on that. What makes them unique? A breakwater itself is not necessarily a new piece of infrastructure, but what makes the living breakwaters unique is that they've been designed with kind of structural modifications that help promote habitat. And designed for juvenile fish to find refuge in the structures. They've been designed for oyster restoration in the future. Designed to not only protect Staten Island from the next superstorm, but to also offer a new model for fighting climate change <laughs> that gives nature a starring role. We now head to Missouri, where a community's concern over high radiation levels caused an elementary school to shut down. Adriana Diaz spoke with parents demanding answers and action. 
When you guys start to see the level of disrespect the Department of Energy had for our community, you're going to be mad. I've been out as well, calling doctors, having blood work done, any of those things that I can do right now to test lead levels. There is fury in Florissant, Missouri, after Jana Elementary School tested positive for dangerous radioactive contaminants. We cannot allow our community to be devastated by the poor choices of people in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and now we're here past the 2000s. That's PTA President Ashley Burnoff, who's been fighting for transparency for nearly a decade. My biggest fear is that our kids are going to end up with illnesses later on in life and that it could have been prevented. How this is even possible dates back to the 1940s and 50s when radioactive waste was stored near what's now St. Louis Airport, contaminating the soil and nearby Coldwater Creek, which frequently overflows. In 2012, the Army Corps of Engineers, which is responsible for cleanup of the area, began testing near the airport and expanded to test along the creek. Army Corps communication to the school district from earlier this year acknowledged low-level radioactive contamination but said it was within acceptable parameters. And while the Corps has tested 300 feet outside the school, the building itself is not within its designated testing area. The Army Corps of Engineers denied us testing, said it wasn't reasonable, and when testing was done, they don't like the results. Lawyers bringing a class action lawsuit hired their own investigator who did test inside the school building. They found unacceptable levels of radioactive lead inside the kitchen, gym and ventilation systems. At the playground, lead levels were 22 times higher than normal. The Army Corps of Engineers told us the report is not consistent with our accepted evaluation techniques and must be thoroughly vetted. The Corps acknowledges there is contamination underground in a nearby wooded area, but says they found no contamination between the creek and the playground. Has your son talked about being worried for his health? Sure. Absolutely. He, um, he understands the real ramifications that come with radioactive nuclear material. This is the stuff his superheroes fight against. Up next, the Liberty Bell tolls for much needed poll workers in the lead up to the election season. This is Eye on America. Welcome back. A nationwide problem has taken shape around elections, a critical shortage of poll workers due in part to a rise in threats against them. Ed O'Keefe spoke to city officials in Philadelphia who are racing to fill the void while keeping safety in mind. Thank you for voting. Major shout out to the election board workers across our country because it's a hard job, it's a thankless job. Philadelphia City Commissioner Omar Sabir says it's part of his job to be a cheerleader for elections. It's also up to his office to help hire the more than 8,000 poll workers the city of brotherly love will need to run elections smoothly. People don't understand that the average uh, poll worker, they're the ones that actually administer the elections. In hopes of filling the jobs, the city recently boosted pay for poll workers. 250 bucks to work more than 12 hours on election day. The first major raise since the 1970s needed to address the growing challenges of the job. So when people say things like elections are fraudulent and things of this nature, it's really a slap an indictment uh, against America. A survey by the nonpartisan Brennan Center says nearly a third of elections officials know of at least one colleague who left the job in part because of fears for their safety, increased threats or intimidation after the 2020 election. Al Schmidt is a former Republican city commissioner who stepped down earlier this year following repeated threats against him and his family, including threats to kill his children. Well, you don't expect one day to be responsible for running elections in a democracy and have to have police go with you when you take your kids sledding in the snow and when you go to the grocery store. Schmidt says the threats of violence and added political pressure 
is transforming what was once a much lower profile form of public service. Typically, campaigns compete against other campaigns. Candidates run against other candidates. And the election administrators are really the referees of it all. So it's an unusual situation to have the referees getting punched and getting tackled. We're um, actually tracking right now about 400 jurisdictions across the country that we've been in touch with that are still looking for folks. James Slusser is with Power the Polls. We're growing the next generation of poll workers. A nonpartisan group that launched during the 2020 election cycle to help find poll workers during the pandemic. How important are poll workers to the democratic process? Oh, they are the essential workers of our democracy. There's a lot of focus around the polarization of our elections, but the folks who are signing up with us, you know, I read the messages that some people send in and they're like, I don't care who people vote for. It's just about everybody in my community being able to be able to cast their ballot. Forgive my cynicism, but those people still exist? Uh, they are signing up every single day, so <laughs> they do still exist. But Schmidt worries if the current threat environment continues, It'll keep forcing out qualified election workers. The danger is that we'll lose experienced election administrators more than we already have. And they'll be replaced by either people with less experience, so more likely to make a mistake when administering an election, and doing it in an environment where any mistake is perceived as being intentional and malicious in some way. Do you think the guys that got together in that building back there would make of all this? Well, they're watching over us. There was a real burden that I know my colleagues and I felt, a real obligation to make sure that we stood up for democracy. It's been more than a year since the Justice Department launched a special elections threats task force and it's faced criticism for only producing one conviction so far as it investigates threats against poll workers across the country. The Justice Department says, however, it continues to investigate cases across the country and expects to have additional prosecutions. We head out west now to California wine country, threatened by climate change. Elizabeth Cook sees firsthand how winemakers are pairing science and technology, adding innovation to their vineyards. A severe drought, rising temperatures, and major fires all threatened to disrupt a California treasure. I'm in the heart of wine country. Behind me, these vines make some of the best cab in the world. But those in the industry are worried that our changing climate is gonna impact their future. How has climate change impacted your crop? Oh, dramatically. Andy Beckstoffer of Napa is the largest grape grower in Northern California. We've never seen drought like this. We've never seen warm years and early harvests like this. Steve Mathiason is a celebrated winemaker. And they all turn. Both they all see the turn. dangers of climate change and like many in the valley, are determined to fight back. Fighting fire, worrying about fire. What are we gonna do about it? We need to be smart as farmers and we need to prepare for it. At their disposal, some some innovative strategies tested on this 40 acre vineyard run by UC Davis. We are forward thinkers. The researchers and the industry are working together and we're thinking of ways to control the environment as much as we can. Teams are studying various rootstocks to see which ones are the most drought and heat resistant. Rows of vines are planted in a different direction to avoid direct sun and layers of leaves as well as artificial shades canopy the fruit in an attempt to keep the clusters cooler. What it also provides is, uh, you know, it uh, lessens the uh, amount of water being evaporated from the uh, soil and the uh, vineyard. Another challenge, wildfires. Burning wood creates tiny compounds that can seep into grapes. If I have a drought condition, I'll lose a part of my harvest. With the, with the smoke, I can lose the whole damn thing. If there's a wildfire or fresh smoke that still contains a lot of these compounds close to a vineyard, Grapes are like little sponges, unfortunately, and they do absorb things from the atmosphere. These compounds, and not the smoke, can taint the wine. Think of um, if you can imagine licking an ashtray. Researchers are working on sensors to detect these compounds on vineyards. They're also working on ways to filter them out of tainted grapes. Flavor development. Andy and Steve are ready to adapt. We know that we need to implement technology so that we can continue to have a healthy business and make world-class wines 25 years from now. After the break, we go inside a Colorado prison, giving voice to inmates seeking a new purpose in life.
We close our show with a story about second chances. A first-of-its-kind radio station produced solely by Colorado Correctional Facility inmates, but making an impact beyond prison walls. Nancy Chin introduces us to the people behind the mic. It is 42 past the hour. Spinning this music for you, man. 90 miles east of Denver, this Colorado radio station runs like any other. I'm your host, Benny Hill, and I've got a good show in store for you today. But the on-air hosts are inmates here in Lyman Correctional Facility. Testing mic one. Testing mic two. Jody Aguirre has been in prison for three decades. Where he goes and when are strictly limited but his voice is one of a handful. So imagine the scenery as you listen to the words of this song. Now traveling far beyond the barbed wire fences. Broadcast to all of Colorado's correctional facilities and streamed online to the public, this is Inside Wire, the nation's first and only statewide prison radio system. Coming up right now, we're gonna go into a nice soft song. What do you like most about being on a radio station? We are being something better than we've been told we've been all of our lives. Let's appreciate the now, the right here and now. Aguirre is one of 14 Absolutely. inmates selected across four prisons to DJ and produce shows on Inside Wire, which launched in March. I am your host, Joaquin Mares, and I am back once again to help you get your morning started off on the right track. Though the station broadcasts 24 seven, each episode is pre-taped and screened by staff and often ends on a note of encouragement. You are worth something and you are valuable. Absolutely. And and you can maybe be on the radio one day, right? There are people who might be watching this who say, how come this is a luxury that you're able to do here? I would say to them, what would you rather have us be doing in here? Beating each other up or creating music shows and radio and helping our fellow men in here and women in here. Do you find that it also humanizes people who a lot of the world forgets about? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It shows that, that we are humans who love and care and have compassion, regret, remorse. And Aguirre says those emotions can often be painful. He was sentenced to life in prison in 1992 for charges including murder. Driven to despair in solitary confinement 20 years ago, Aguirre says he tried to take his own life until something came over the prison's radio system. The song, Don't Give Up, by Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush came on. I don't remember what song was on before that. Don't give up. All I remember is that I heard those words, don't give up, we love you, and uh, I, I just forgot everything I was doing, and uh, here I am. You know, I didn't die that day. It spoke to you. And that's what I hope to do. I want this radio program to save somebody's life, to, to, to lift somebody up. That connection is what Inside Wire general manager Ryan Conero envisioned. You can come up to full oh, with the, uh, faster after your voice ends. You know. When he helped launch the station in. in partnership with the University of Denver's Prison Arts Initiative. The best we can do when someone, when any of us commits harm is actually work to take responsibility for that to repair that and then go forward. So you're trying to create a community here. Yes, there's a community at each prison, but whether or not the people there, both who work there and live there, view it or think of it as that, that's the question. And the answer has been forming here in real time. Well, up to the minute with Mr. Dean Williams, Mr. Dean Williams himself. Programming on Inside Wire includes inmates, interviewing correctional officers and other prison staff. After me, please. Projection. 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 Articulation. Articulation. Inflection. Inflection. Conroe no. guides inmates on the basics of broadcasting, editing, and even using a computer, many for the first time ever. It seems like it's about much more than just a radio station. It really is. Inside wire. Inside wire.
95% of people in this country who are incarcerated are going to be returning to their communities. And so when they do that, how can we be a part of that being a productive, positive journey? And I think Inside Wire can be a little part of that. How much do you take into consideration victims' concerns here? We take victims' concerns very seriously. If someone is going to move from committing harm to repairing that harm, that includes that person taking accountability. And if the victim wants to engage in that dialogue, then that's how the person needs to show up. Inside Wire's name refers to Wire as a connection. Ready for some football, you know what I mean? A connection that has the power to travel 90 miles, reaching Aguirre's daughter, Amber Baca. My boys get to listen to him, my husband, and so it, it makes a sense of like we're together even though we can't be. She was just 11 years old when her father was arrested. I'm gonna take you into some cool songs right now. Now first she listens one, first thing every Tuesday morning when his show airs. Are you proud of your dad? I'm very proud of my dad. The strength that he has and the strength that he's been able to withhold this whole time, I feel like most people would crumble under, but he just strives and gets higher and higher. And that's really important to me. Why is that? because I love him and he deserves it. He's worked really hard at being the best person that he can be. Though he'll likely never leave prison, Aguirre is striving to be a better man than the one who first walked in. <laughs> Do what I remember. <laughs> I go to my cell and uh, I feel like I've accomplished something, something every day. All you have to do is be better. It's as simple as that. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America. Sponsored by United Healthcare Medicare Plans. Get Medicare with more.